Hello and welcome back to All for Women's Football. The last seven days, it's never a quiet moment, is it, in women's football? There's always so much going on. We've got the FA Cup, we've got promotion and relegation confirmed for a few teams. We've got some some interesting games going on in Italy, which Mia is going to fill us in on as well. It's in the title pile, potentially on the move to Barcelona. There's so much, and that's only just scratching the surface. We're going to try and go through all of it in the next 60 minutes or so. So, yeah, get your thoughts and get your comments and all of those kinds of things. We'll see you after this short little intro. <laughs> Yes, hello and welcome back. I do love that. Idea. I think I can't remember who it was that was hosting a few weeks ago that said like we can obviously some of us can see each other backstage and just like nodding along like, as, that, as that intro's going. It is quite catchy, isn't it? On, <laughs> on that one. Um, yeah, TJ, don't switch off. You know, it's been a while. I genuinely, it's been that long since I've hosted on here. I had to ask the guys what like the intro f- format was. So it's been that. I, I genuinely can't remember that. Like early Feb, I think it was. It's been a while since <laughs> I've last hosted on here. So quite a while, but there we are. Let's go around the house, do the usual, see how everyone's doing on this one. I'm doing it in reverse order, though, just to throw everyone off because I see Barry was ready to answer that one. So I'll start with you, Laura. How are you doing after the weekend? I'm good, thank you. I um, I have an exam that we've not been taught any of the spec for on Friday, so it's been a fun weekend amid f- other football matches, which I have enjoyed, but... Yeah, my, my coverage hasn't been too comprehensive this weekend, I'm afraid. So I might be just kind of giving a vague opinion here and there. Um, but yeah, other than the stress, it's, it's been pretty pretty good. You did a nice little TikTok as well, didn't you, over the weekend? Yeah, yeah. I went to the Spurs game and then it was back to revising. But yeah, that was pretty cool. I was in the media box. So that was nice. Very yeah, swish cool. facilities there. Because they certainly looked it. If uh, people haven't seen it, go and check out the ticks up on that one. Because uh, it certainly looked a nice, uh, not that like other press boxes aren't, but that one certainly <laughs> looks one of the, the nicest on that one. Um, Meg, it's been the first time I've done a show with you literally since uh, early Feb, because obviously I wasn't on your comeback show last week. Um, yeah, how are you getting on? I'm, I'm liking your background. All the shirts, be- I've only got the one, but you know, you've you've outdone me there with about 50. <laughs> you've got a pretty old. It was exactly the same last week, and it yeah that that was bought up. And no, it's not just for the Monday nights. It's what my dad did for when I for when I came back home. So no, it's it's a great backdrop. But no, doing well. I mean, Arsenal men made me really depressed over the weekend, and then Arsenal women kind of picked up my spirits with a nice victory over Bristol. So yeah, not too bad. Mixed emotions. That's what happens when you <laughs> when you uh, support both men's and women's sides for your respective teams. Mia, how are you doing? It's good to see you on f- less than twenty four hours <laughs> from uh, from Lee Sports Village. Um, I'm yeah. How are you getting on? I'm great. Uh, I woke up this morning with a really sore throat because we did a lot of screaming and shouting yesterday. Uh, so yeah, if my voice goes, it's probably for the best for everyone. But um. Yeah, I'm doing amazing, Connor. I'm really doing amazing. That's good to hear. It's good to hear. I'm liking it so far. And go on, Barry, complete the full house and tell us how amazing that you are. No, I've, I've had a terrible weekend. Nothing good's happened. It's been absolutely atrocious. All the football's been terrible. Um, frankly, I don't know what I'm doing here. It's, it's been awful. Uh, worst weekend of my life ever. Not. <laughs> Brilliant. What a day. What a time to be alive. Um, Genuinely, yesterday, <clears throat> oh, the football that was on was ridiculous. Being able to watch the Spurs game, then being able to watch the United game. I did watch the Arsenal men. I wish I could say I was laughing, but I wasn't. I was well annoyed that they lost that. So I was probably not as depressed as Meg, but I wasn't, wasn't ecstatic. Uh, and then, of course, seeing the WSL fight as well, uh, WSL match as well. So, yeah, absolutely superb. What a day of football it was yesterday. Yeah, there we go. Glad to hear it. My internet cut out or something cut out halfway through that, so I have no idea what you said halfway through it, and that is not a good telltale sign for the rest of this show. So if I drop out, Barry, I'm looking at you because you're closest to me on screen, so hop into the hosting chair and I'll send you over the notes <laughs> got on this one. Um, Sean, no, it won't be because we're not going to start with United, and uh, we're only going to briefly touch on United because so we've literally just done an hour and a half talking about United versus Chelsea. We're going to have to talk about it because obviously it's the FA Cup. There's only two games to talk about being the semi-finals. So we will cover it, but it won't just be all United loving. Um, you know, go and watch all for United WFC for that. If you want to go and check out on that one. Um, I'm going to pin Sean's comment about Juventus because I'm sure we'll come back to that 
a bit later on. Um, Laura, so I'll come to yourself first. We obviously know there's two brand new finalists. You were at, obviously, the Spurs game yesterday. So I'll start with Spurs, Leicester. Surprisingly, Leicester taking the lead. And I think I remember I stood around with the people I was with at LSV going, hang on a minute. <laughs> like, this is not in, I don't know. I think a lot of people probably thought it was going to be running the mill Spurs maybe a bit easier than maybe it was. But yeah, how did you see the game? And obviously, you know, seeing Spurs first time in their history, you know, making it to the, to the FA Cup final. Yeah, um, it was a really interesting game, actually. I thought I thought Leicester did really well and were, like, so unlucky, especially with the way it happened, like, leading 1-0 for about 80 minutes of the match to go to equalise to send it to extra time and then to concede in the 118th minute the, the eventual winner. I thought that was really brutal for a Leicester team that had actually been really good. Like, they looked really solid. They defended well. Um, I thought Deanne Rose looked really good when she got forward. She missed a couple of chances, but looked really good. Um, and yeah, I I was I was pretty disappointed. I think penalties would have been fair of the game. I thought Tottenham looked really wasteful at times um, throughout. I mean, Jess Nows, who scored um, the equaliser, she missed so many chances. Like she was great, played so well. Um, but then when she had a shot on target, was just being so wasteful with them and just didn't look like she could score until she put that one away. And it was like the most clinical finish you'll see. So I just thought it was a very strange game, very flat for a lot of the second half. And Tottenham kind of were a little bit jammy. It was a Leicester mistake. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm probably a little bit biased, obviously, being an Arsenal fan. I was supporting Leicester for most of the match. But... Yeah, it was nice to kind of like just be there and see two teams in women's football that hadn't been to that stage before and one of them was going to get to the final. And you know what? I actually really like Robert Villaham and I was pretty pleased that, you know, they, that team did get through. But yeah, really unfortunate for Leicester and I thought they gave it like a way better game. But yeah, Jutta Rantala is so good. That finish was insane for Leicester. Um, yeah, just a, just a good game to be at um, overall. I was going to say, for Leicester to, to concede two late ones, as you said, obviously, it was late in the second half to send it to extra time, then late in extra time as well to, to win it. That's just like a double double uh, you know, blow for, <clears throat> for them, really, as you mentioned. The strike was exceptional um, from, from a Leicester point of view on that one. Meg, did it go the way that you expected it to go? Was it a bit closer than you thought it was going to go? How did you kind of see it from, from your point of view? In all honesty, when I looked at the two semifinals, Man U, Chelsea and... Spurs Leicester I, I looked at Spurs Leicester as the one that was going to be the closer game of the two I, in in all honesty I thought you know Chelsea were going to beat Manu obviously that wasn't the case but um no I mean I think when Martha Thomas scored her header I mean it was a brilliant header um the, I think the commentator said something like the last time she scored or something was in the North London derby. And I was like, yeah, no, no need for that. Um, or the last time she scored at the Spurs stadium was in the North London derby when they beat us. I was like, yeah, no need for that. But yeah, I mean, as Laura said, it, it's just exciting that it was Spurs against Leicester in the semi-final. You know, either team that was to make it through was a new team in the final. And yeah, Rantala's goal was, uh, when I saw it go in, I was like, I, I, I yeah, it was unbelievable. And I think um there was an I think it was an early chance for Spurs. Um Celine Bazette. Um it was a pass from Clinton. And I I just think Clinton's vision and the passes that she can pick out, I mean, she's unbelievable. And if Spurs keep hold of her next season, which I think they will, yeah, she's gonna be unbelievable for them. And she's gonna be unbelievable for the Lionesses going forward as well. No, certainly on, on that one. I want to get back to individual play because Grace is definitely some love when we're talking about the final. I'm sure, we'll we'll come back to obviously with her being cup time for the final. And uh, and and she's made her feelings pretty clear on Instagram which side she is supporting when it comes to the final, and rightfully so. We've just spoken about it and all you know, WFC, I think it is fair. she's played for Spurs, <laughs> you know, all season. She's gonna be supporting them. Nothing wrong with that. Um, Mia, did it go the way you were kind of expected again? Like I, I kind of agree with what Meg said there, like I think when we looked at the semi final, I think we did a show actually on this when the draw was made on this channel. We were saying about like we probably expected Chelsea to go through and and that Spurs would would probably make an easy game out of Leicester. But again, like Leicester fought well, you know, in that one. And, to, and also at a bigger ground, obviously, maybe at the, at the Spurs, I don't know what it was called these days, the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, um, to put on that kind of performance, you know, fair play to them, right? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, going into that game, uh, I, I didn't know who would come out of it, the winner. I, I really didn't because on their day, both those teams can put gritty performances in. Um, they've shown throughout the season um, that they have the players, they have the perseverance to push through games and win games that potentially you might not have expected them to win. And this game had so much pressure on it for both sides because obviously it's an, it's a semi-final and, and neither of those teams have ever been in the final. So there's a, there's a lot on the line for both of them. And then to play a game like that, you just, first of all, you have to say fair play to both sides. Um, and then you have to say fair play to Tottenham, who always, always nick it at the end. Um, that's true to their form. But yeah, I'm 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 happy for Tottenham. I think, you know, either one of those sides getting through is is a superb achievement. And I have no doubt there'll be a lot of Spurs fans in at Wembley. Um, based in London helps, of course. Um, but yeah, it should be a really, really good game between United and Spurs. And, you know, we get to see that run through this weekend. So, yeah, I'm happy for, happy for Tottenham, gutted for Leicester, but I would have been the same <laughs> if that result would have switched. So, yeah. I think that was the beauty of it, wasn't it? The, the fact that United, because I think a lot of people thought that they were going to try and do, not you know, any conspiracy or anything like that, but they would try and keep United and Chelsea apart. So that would then be the final. Um, <clears throat> but the fact that... You, for those two teams, there was that opportunity of, of getting to Wembley for the first time and, and could go on now, obviously, from a Spurs point of view, to win it. Um, another North versus South final, yes, indeed. Um, Barry, I want to come to you on this game. Also, Luke's comment, you know, Martha coming up big when it really matters. Obviously, a player that we know well, you know, from, from United, she spoke about maybe not being as confident at United. She's moved to Spurs started the season exceptionally well you know a lot of people thought she was on for the golden boot after the first kind of couple of months uh, of the season you know for for her to get that moment to win that there's no great feeling is that scoring a last minute winner to, to send your team to to Wembley or to a cup final or to win a trophy you know those kind of moments and that's going to do her the, the world of good for a player like I said who started the season well but kind of dropped away a little bit and, and wasn't scoring as frequently I mean, yeah, it's been unbelievable. I mean, the whole game, Connor, was just... <laughs> it was it was not the most exciting of games you're ever going to sit there and watch, but I think it was one which had the most intrigue. I think Meg was right to say it was going to be probably the closer of the two games in terms of not really knowing where it was going to go. And Leicester were just hanging on in there, and then they went on and took the lead. And the goal from Rantala was just... <laughs> I was stood up here in my kitchen making me sausages and eggs and all that sort of stuff, getting ready for a bit of brunch. And because uh, Tesco's were shut, didn't open till 12. It's outrageous. Like, what is that all about? Who opens up at 12 on a Sunday? I'll just send a complaint about that. Thank you for reminding me. Um, but whilst I was happily doing that, I just heard, and Leicester have taken the lead. I'm like, shut up, have they? And honestly, the, the, the curl and the way she's just banged that in with like almost as if she was just passing it two foot in the other direction was just superb. It was just a skill that I wish I possessed. Um, that was superb. And to be honest, I, I thought at that point that Spurs were done for because as the game went on, they just did not seem to have the password to, to get through Leicester's defence. Oh, absolutely. 100%. Like I got there at 11 o'clock and it's shut. Why? Every other shop opens at 10. That is the most insane thing I've ever noticed in my life. So you can trust on me, Sean. I'll sort that out. Um, so when Jessica Nad scored in the 83rd minute, I was surprised, to be honest with you. I didn't really see it coming. Um, but fair play to them. They did not give up at all. And, um, you know, they, they finally got through, got the equaliser. Um, as far as Martha Thomas went, it was very interesting because you hear people... Um, like you've got Luke saying there, Martha comes up big when it really matters. Now, obviously, we all recall 
some of the seasons that we've had. I mean, the, 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 whenever somebody mentions the name Martha Thomas, the thing that instantly comes up in my mind uh, was a game against Aston Villa. Uh, it was Man United against Aston Villa. And to be honest with you, it was the most frustrating game I've ever watched in my life. Um, it was one where Leslie Russo was taken off um, as our main goal threat. And for, for some crazy reason, we brought on a midfielder. Um, and it just it didn't make any sense to me at all. But there was a ball that came across the six-yard box that Martha Thomas slid in for, and, and she got there uh, and put it wide. It was it was painful. Martha Thomas at Man United was not the Martha Thomas that we're seeing here at Spurs. And hearing what she said about confidence and how she's feeling with that, it's, it's quite clear that she wasn't confident at United because every time she's played the game for Spurs, she's been out of this world. She's played incredibly well. Um, you know, even in Scotland, you've not seen masses of goals from her, but certainly here at, at Spurs, she's she's absolutely settled in to, to life and fair play to her. You know, I'm, I'm pleased for her that she's had that opportunity to do well. Um, I'm pleased for Grace Clinton that she's had the chance to help get aside to the to the final. Um, I just felt for Leicester, really. I think, you know, lots of people say penalties is a, a nasty way to go out of a competition. I'm not sure I completely agree with that. I think that actually sometimes that's what it takes is a little bit of luck because, you know, you could argue that conceding a goal two minutes before the end of extra time um, is just as heartbreaking and just as unlucky, uh, however it comes about. But... You know, fair play. Spurs made it through, and that was one half of the final decided. <clears throat> and Laura, I want to throw it back to you with with that very question. And obviously, the fact that, as Barry just said, one half of the final. So United did win uh, the other half against Chelsea, against pretty much. Every, and I, I say this, you know, from I think ninety percent of the United fan base also thought that United were going to lose as well. You know, I don't think anyone really deep down expected United to win that one. Um, so looking at it from that point of view, it's almost like a two-part question. In terms of, obviously, it's it's going to be a new name on the cup now, regardless. You know, in terms of, you know, whoever wins it out of United or Spurs. You know, do do you think this shows the growth in the league? The fact that we're we're seeing, I, I can't remember. There was, I, I think Tom Gary put the the tweet out. It's been well over ten years since this has happened. You know, since any one of the, the Chelsea, City, and, and Arsenal have not been in the final. And I think it's twenty twelve since someone. I think it was Birmingham back then that won it outside of those three. So it's been a long time <clears throat> for someone to break this done. Do you think that does show the growth in it, you know, in the fact that, you know, we're seeing two two potential, obviously, new winners? But also, I want to flip it to, like I said, it's two-part for you. But also, from a Chelsea point of view, do you think maybe the pressure has got to them a little bit, the fact that they're falling away so much? <clears throat> you know, one week, you know, a couple, you go back a couple of weeks, the quadruple's on. Now they're down to two and facing <laughs> one of the best teams around in Barcelona. Yeah, um, I think it definitely does show the growth of the league. And I think that's been very apparent. Obviously, last season, we had a very, very competitive top four, potentially less so this season. But United are still obviously in the FA Cup final. And then Tottenham this season have been really kind of insurgent. And you can really start. I think they're probably one of the most convincing projects in the league. Like, I would say Tottenham have a more convincing project than perhaps Arsenal at the moment. And I'm kind of jealous because I think Arsenal obviously levels above at the moment because of the players and the quality. And I love Arsenal and I think they are still a great team. But I think the the project at Tottenham feels a little clearer with Villaham. You can really see how that's changed even within one season. So looking forward, they're quite a scary prospect and you can really see that growth. Um, and I think to see teams that are getting that investment that are kind of really looking, okay, who who's best to manage our women's team? Not just, okay, who's a good name? Who's someone that's been around the game that will do for now? It's kind of like, okay, let's go to Sweden and find a great manager that can take our team forward, which is what Tottenham have done. And investing in the sense of like having the game at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium and getting that in the right way. And I feel like the way that they, the clubs are talking at the moment really feels like they're backing that. And again, the fact that the semi-final was so competitive, even with a team like Leicester, who last season were like relegation battlers, definitely demonstrating growth. In terms of Chelsea, yeah, I don't know what's going on there. I feel like Emma Hayes feels like she's got a bit of an air of like, I'm leaving my job, I don't really care. Like, I don't think that is 
how like Emma Hayes' mentality is not that. But at the same time, I think the whole like press conference stuff, I don't know if you'd necessarily get that from a manager that's still going to be in their job next season, which I don't know whether, I don't think anything will be like conducted in that way. I think they're utterly professional. But there's another part of it that's like, is there just like an element of that that's creeping into the psyche of this manager's not going to be there next season? Like, there's part of the team that must want to fight for it, but there's another part where it's all getting a bit weird around Chelsea, all this press conference business. And I, I just, it just feels like it's changing in terms of the kind of vibe around Chelsea. And there's a lot of uncertainty there. So yeah, maybe dropping off, but I'm also like still convinced that they'll pull something off in the Champions League or the league. And they've definitely still got that in them. It's certainly you mentioned the because she made a obviously a controversial comment. Um, you know, when asked like every manager was about you know player manager relationship not uh, a few weeks back. Then obviously you mentioned the Conti Cup final. What happened with Jonas there? Then doubled down on it. Then obviously the the, the press conference not so long about talking about you know she went into some talking about poems and and speaking about that. And it was like yeah, I, I don't quite know what's going going on there. So we'll roll back around to the Champions League maybe a little bit later if we've got time towards the end, but. Meg, from your point of view, same kind of question. In fact, I'm, I'm just going to let you just go one after the other so I don't have to keep asking the same question on that one. So just free flow, Mia after that, and then Barry following. So does it, does it show the growth, uh, the fact that we've got a brand new winner uh, and two new finalists and also Chelsea in terms of, do you think it's a pressure thing or do you think there's something else going on there? I completely agree with what Laura said. I think it's, you know, it really does show growth in the women's game overall. Um, obviously, at the start of the season, we saw the likes of, Leicester and Liverpool like getting what was it two or three wins in a row and you know you think oh are they going to creep into the top four this season obviously that's not going to be the case but it's exciting that we've sort of that we get those moments where we think oh this team might creep into the top four or this team might get Champions League and they don't normally or this team are not in the, the relegation battle for once sort of thing um, and, and I love that and on Chelsea I mean it's it's so weird because last season I was in a I went I did a press conference with Emma Hayes ahead of one of their Champions League games and someone asked her about you know the importance of winning the Champions League basically and I remember it so clearly because she said I myself I've already got a Champions League winner's medal um from when she was on the coaching staff at Arsenal um and that just baffled me that you know fair enough she answered it you know, in a personal sense, but in a Chelsea sense, she, you know, she didn't really answer it and say that Chelsea are desperate for this Champions League. Obviously, they were desperate for it last season. They're desperate again for it this season. But the fact that, you know, they've not won the Conti Cup again this season, they're now out of the FA Cup and, you know, they're not necessarily going to run away with, with the league this season. Man City are hot on their heels and it'll be interesting to see who will be crowned WSL champions this season. But is it a pressure thing? I, I honestly don't know. I think there is an element of, you know, it's Emma Hayes' last season, but that should uh, spur the play players on to want to win everything, shouldn't it? I mean, if I was a, you know, a player playing for a manager um, who was about to leave, I'd want to do everything in my power to make sure, you know, I win every trophy possible for them but um yeah it'll be interesting to see you know because they're facing Barcelona in the semi-finals of the Champions League that, that, that is not going to be easy and you know if if they fall short there they've only got the league to contend for and to yeah as Connor said to think back you know only a few weeks they were in contention for the quadruple that's just yeah that's absolutely crazy I think naturally when you look at stuff like this you're gonna you're gonna there is growth there's obviously growth to this because you know this is unlike anything we've seen as you said Connor for the last 10 years so there's definitely growth there's a lot of quality in the players throughout the the WSL whereas before it was just the top three top four who had the best of the best there are quality players throughout the whole of the WSL and um that show, that's showing, absolutely. Um, and in terms of Chelsea, for me, I feel like 
they're they're slightly complacent. They've spent a long time being the main, the, the dominant side in the WSL, and they get to finals and they win it. I feel like this season everyone has stepped up, and Chelsea are still just playing how they usually do, and arguably are complacent. They, as Meg said, they lost the Conti Cup. They're out the semi-finals of the FA Cup. Really interesting to see how they play Barcelona now because they could still bottle the, the the WSL. They could come out of this with nothing. So they have to sort of pick themselves up a little bit here and, and think, you know, that they really could lose it all from going from the quadruple to to nothing. So yeah, I mean, it's it, as I say, it's definitely growth, uh, and I do think that Chelsea need to to pick themselves up again because the quality of the teams around them are only getting better. It's um, definitely an interesting one, isn't it? Um, obviously, the, the United Chelsea game was something we've spoken about extensively for the, for the last 90 minutes, um, which is almost as long as the match took place, uh, just in injury time. That's how long it felt. Um, but we, we spoke last week about Emma Hayes and her reaction to everything that had happened in the game against Arsenal. I think what was really sad about that was that it meant the way that she chose to behave at the end of that then became the focal point for this game also. Now, I heard some conversation prior to the match where they were talking about, is this classic Emma Hayes trying to get the pressure and putting it all on herself so that it's not on her players? Um, I thought that was quite insightful and quite an interesting thing. But equally, I think it's caused a massive sideshow at that football club now. It just won't go away now. And I think she could have quite easily brushed this all under the carpet just by simply uttering those immortal words. Do you know what? I just shouldn't have shed what I said. You know, I wasn't happy with the way that he behaved. Um, but, you know, I went, I went OTT with it. And what was mad to them watch was how she came out with an analogy. I mean, it was like watching me on, on all for United, um, you know, because I love an, a, a good analogy. But the fact that she effectively, if you listen to what she said properly, she effectively said, I shouldn't have done what I did. But then she goes off about telling the teacher. And I just think to myself, well, who are you going to tell? Like, did you tell the ref? Is that what you mean? Did you just tell the ref? I think he's been a little bit aggressive. Like, I don't know. I, I don't understand who the teacher was in this um, little situation that she had put herself at earthquake in this place, probably. Probably. Um, so, yeah, I just, listen, it was tough. Um, I then tweeted yesterday that I, and I put this genuinely, I said it about Jurgen Klopp as well. This is why you don't tell people that you're leaving. Alex Ferguson did this years ago and we had an absolute meltdown. The team just, like some of them were on their holidays already going brilliant, no more hair dryer, superb. Uh, and it just dropped. The performance levels dropped. The same things happened here with both Liverpool uh, in the men's game and now Chelsea in the women's game. And it's a really interesting dynamic. I just wonder if she'd have kept this under her hat and hadn't told anyone, maybe just, you know, the people that need to know above her. I'd be intrigued to see because Megan mentioned about you'd, you'd expect these players to want to go off and do as the best they possibly can. I would argue that's the pressure. Like they know they need to do it this season for her to have it. So because they feel like they owe her so much, because she's so respected in the game, is it that thing where you're trying hard, but you're trying too hard? So you don't have the ability to let your natural game play. Um, quite often where you might be doing things like tipping the ball over the top and doing these little flicks and tricks that you would normally do that come just naturally to you. On this occasion, you may be trying to play too safe. You're trying to make sure you're doing all the basics correct. So as a result, you're not using the flair that you would usually use in a game to try and make the difference. So I exactly that, Jess. Are Chelsea overthinking things now because Hayes is leaving? And I think maybe there is a little bit of that. Uh, and maybe the pressure now that they've gone out of two trophies is the fact that they may not win anything at all. Um, 
uh, Arsenal winning, we'll, we'll get to that, I'm sure, was was huge in the WSL because that's made a real difference. And the Champions League is by no means something that they're guaranteed to do. But I think the big stat for me, with regards to all of this, in all honesty, is it's not about Chelsea. People are speaking about the growth of the game, and I think that's massive. Like, forget the fact that it's Man United in the final, forget the fact it's Spurs. I think the thing that matters here is that come the 12th of May, for the first time in 12 years, there's going to be a name that is not Arsenal, Chelsea or Manchester City on the winner's trophy. And little quiz, sorry to take over your show here, Connor, but can anyone think when the last year was when there wasn't an Arsenal or Chelsea or a City in the final? You've just said it, haven't you? Who just said it? No, you you literally just said it, didn't you? No, I didn't. I said won it. I'm saying now in the final. So they've Birmingham given us City. Birmingham City 2012? Or is that is there one more recent? Oh, no. 2004-2005 was the last time there wasn't an Arsenal or Chelsea or a City in the FA Cup final. Uh, and it was the mighty Charlton against Everton. So that's almost 19 years that there has been an Arsenal, a Chelsea or a City in the final. Um, and so I, I think... Was, me, I, was two. I was two. That's mad. I was only two. <laughs> so for me, when you're talking about the growth of the game, this is what matters to me. It's the fact that we're now seeing... Um, a bit more excitement in the game. And I think really, for me, that's that's amazing. Yeah, no, th that's mad. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's quite something. It's been that long. But it just shows, you know, it, it, the women's game has been very dominant at the top. You know, th there's a lot happening further down the pyramids, but it's been very, you know, kind of heavy on the tr traditional top three, which is why when Man United broke into it last season, it was such a big thing. So it was like breaking up that top three for God knows how, I think it was 10 years or nine years or something, that that top three hadn't been broken at that point. So now we're talking about the FA Cup final. Um, and yeah, that's 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 amazing to see on that one. Um, right, we'll move away from the FA Cup slightly, because it's, well, slightly, completely. Um, <laughs> we're halfway through, we're half an hour in already, and we've not even touched on any of the other things on there. I wanted to briefly talk about because it, it is in the title, um, and I, I'm not going to go around, you know, everyone, unless everyone's got something to say on this. So I'm just going to throw the question out there and see if anyone jumps on it. So the reports came out earlier that Pyle potentially is signing for Barcelona. Um, conflicting reports the tier what i'm going to call them a tier one because they are very reliable in germany says that this is signed and she is definitely going to barcelona and the 500,000 release of course has been paid reports in spain are doubting that a little bit saying there is a, there's heavy interest and it will likely get done but barca are negotiating a lower fee so it's slightly mixed some are saying it's closer or do, more done than than potentially others has anyone got any thoughts on this? Because Barcelona's team is stacked already. <laughs> if they add an elite forward like a pile into that front three, now, I mean, that's just surely taking the mick right? <laughs> out of the rest of Spanish football and European football when they go into the Champions League, right? Because, I mean, Shane's made the point here. I wasn't even going to have any players left at this point. They've already lost Oberdorf to, to Bayern. Pyle is definitely leaving this summer. It's just more of a case of where to look likely Barcelona. And I, I'm telling you now, there's going to be a lot more that are leaving this summer as well. But is anyone surprised by this? That it's potentially Barcelona? Because the report about 10 days ago, that was it was that she was coming to United, or in more specific terms, England. Now it looks like she's going over to, to Barca. Me shaking her head. So that... Yeah, I just don't know where Barca keeps storing these players. Uh, they don't. They don't need her at all. It's not like anyone is really testing Barcelona to be the top team in the world. Like they've got very, very little com um, competition. So I don't know why they need her. Uh, they don't need her. Uh, and also, I would then expect probably some outgoings. In which case, because I'm not being funny. If you're playing for Barcelona, you're the best of the best. Do you want to be sitting on the bench? Probably not. So. It's it, for me. I think it's really strange, and I can't work out what. Especially now, you know, Geraldes is is leaving. He's he's not going to be there next season. Not that Payol's a player that you're going to sort of not want. Um, but yeah, I just think it's a weird one before the manager leaves, and um, yeah, they don't need her. Is the bottom line? 
I think as well, Shane and, and Sean have just mentioned two other names from a Wolfsburg point of Janssen, and also if Brand is going to be off on, as well. Yeah, it's just you, you mentioned outgoings from Barca. I am going to throw a name out there that I think could be a potential Cal Dente. I think is the most likely I could see someone moving out of Barca in way of pile potentially. And Pateas' contract is still not sorted yet, I believe, as well. So there's still you know a few question marks there, you know, in terms of what happens. Um and yeah, like Polly's raised a good point here. <laughs> One minute Barca have got no money, next minute they're paying five hundred grand for for players, and it won't be the only signing they make either. I don't quite know how they keep getting around this. Um oh, I said someone I shouldn't, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um yeah. I just threw a name out there. Don't don't quote me as a source or anything else. <laughs> I did I'm just throwing names out there as the first time I saw when I looked at the pass sheet. Um but yeah, you add her into that front three, I think it should be ridiculous. And I think we just see more, like you said, Ben, it's not like they've got competition really anyway. <laughs> They're already, already the best around. But if you're Pyro, you're not saying no, are you? Like, you go into the best team in, in Europe um, and likely going to win trophies and everything else. So, yeah, I can see it. Has anyone got anything else to add on? Oh, Meg's on mute. She's going in. <laughs> I was literally just going to say when you said likely to win trophies, I feel like it's like it's not even likely. It's just if you if you sign for Barcelona women, it's a guarantee. Like it just is. But no, it, no, it's it'll be interesting because what you know what are, Barcelona are the best of the best. What what do they try and do next? Like what do you do when you're the best of the best? Do you just keep signing the best players in the world? And well, obviously you do, and you want to try and be the best of the best for as long as you can. But yeah, I mean, they yeah, they don't need her. But the bottom line is they don't need her. And you know, if she if she had come to Man U, for example, it just makes the WSL more exciting to have a name like that in the WSL and stuff. But of course, you're not going to say no to Barcelona, especially if she's already been told that. You know, she'll be a regular starter. I'm sure those conversations have already been had. So, yeah, it'll be interesting. Is there a chance that if Barcelona keep on signing up all of these best players, best players, best players, best players, that they can end up like the Real Madrid of old, where they end up with all the Galacticos and ended up winning absolutely nothing at all because there was too many egos? I think there's a potential. Okay, good. I no, I don't. I don't think it's beyond. That's a possibility. Is what I'm saying. Um, I don't think you get that many egos in women's football anyway. Certainly not as many as you do in the men's. But it it, it could happen. Um, I, yeah, Erling's made the point as well about Barca oh, signing play. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know. Um, maybe we need to get someone on who's like knowledgeable, really knowledgeable in Spanish football and, and they're kind of like what's going on over there because it, it baffles me how one minute like Barca are close to transfer bans and all these kinds of things. Yeah, they just keep signing players, <laughs> like on the men's and women's. All of a sudden, they've got all these millions to throw about. I don't know. Um, yeah. Oh, Laura's unmuted now. She's going for it. Go on. I was just I thought it'd be quite quite interesting point that Barcelona are obviously going to have a new manager next season, and as much as like success is having the best players and their squad obviously just looks unbeatable, you can have a lot of good players and not a good system. So if there is a bit of change, like I still think there's a bit of uncertainty if they're just throwing money at the best players. I don't think it's always necessarily the best tactic. If you're going to be, it's almost like, is it more sensible for them this season to just kind of keep the system that they've got and let the change happen with the manager so that they've got more continuity? I don't know. I mean, realistically, they're probably just going to go on to win everything again next season. But like, there is a little bit more jeopardy, I think, in moving to Barcelona with a potentially new manager than uh and I was also wondering the same as Sean do we know the new Barcelona manager yet I don't think we do but I don't think it's been confirmed yet has it aren't they promoting from within isn't that the report that they're going for yeah as I commented there I'm pretty sure they're promoting uh the assistant off which is that's a very Spanish thing to do isn't it they're like promoting from within their like academy squads and and everything else so yeah and Shane's with you it's a key point from Laura John yeah, I agree. I think you never know. You know, in football, it's a strange thing. I said, Bayern, we're going to get to the final this year. And <laughs> they got knocked out at the group stages. So, you know, it, anything can happen. 
Um, Barcelona fan there in the chat who's actually put it down. Apparently, they don't have a Mambo number five. I mean, a pure number nine. So, they guess that's the thinking behind it. Yeah, to be fair, a lot of the reaction on Twitter was about that, about from Barca fans saying they needed a proper number nine. So, but to be fair, Palmer's been playing out wide a lot this season. So, what they've know. been tanking teams like seven, eight, nil. What do you mean they need a proper number nine? <laughs> they score goals across the. They don't need a number nine. It's just not double figures, Mia. They want ten. Oh my goodness! I think that's ridiculous. Oh, well, what do I? What do I know? I've never won a Champions League. <laughs> you make a good point, but I think it's very much like, yeah, there you go, one five. <laughs> they conceded, it's shocking those. <laughs> but no, I, maybe the, I, I don't watch enough of Barca to comment on them. To be fair, but I would imagine, you know, by saying they need number nine, they're quite wasteful in front of goal. Which can you imagine, like Graham Hansen putting crosses into Pyre or something like that? It's just. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We might see some, see some heavy score lines in that one. Um, while we're talking about other leagues away from England, then Mia, it feels a good time to throw it over to you. Um, Sean put it in the chat earlier saying Juventus were amazing. I hear. I don't actually know what the score was, so I, don't, I can't tell whether he's being sarcastic or not. Of course <laughs> he one. is. Of course oh, he, he is. is. He is. Um, yeah, let's talk Italian football because I've been waiting for this moment for a very long time. So, yeah, today, if you're unsure, uh, was Juventus versus Roma. <sighs> Just to give you a little bit of background behind this game, it's always a big game because they're the two biggest teams in, in the league. Um, Roma have just won their first ever, as in last season, they won their first ever title. And they stopped Juventus's historic run of five on the trot um since since they were sort of created Juventus in 2017 that they'd, they'd won every single title since then so Roma have disrupted that slightly and Juventus had had a, a really horrendous season this season really really bad uh currently Roma are 13 points clear at the top of the table uh Juventus lost today 2-1 to Roma uh, it was a really horrendous game to watch if you're a Juventus fan. Roma are just dominant. And if anyone saw them in the Champions League last season, they were a lot better than they were this season. But they have a really, really solid sort of project that they're doing at the minute. Their manager is one of the most underrated managers in Europe. He is superb tactically. He know, He really does know what he's talking about. And... Um, it's you can see when when they're playing that it's it's a really interesting watch. So Roma have won twenty games this season. They have lost one in twenty one games. They've lost one game, so they are flying through the league. Um, so yeah, if you're a Juventus fan today, it wasn't very good for you. <laughs> um. But I want to talk a little bit more about Juventus just really quickly whilst we're talking about Italian football, because a name that comes out of my mouth a lot is Ariana Caruso. And these guys are really bored of hearing it, I'm sure. But she's recently signed a deal that takes her up to 2026. She had signed an extension at the end of last season. They have just, just, they have to keep her. She is integral to the team. Um, and they know that, which is why they've signed her again. But I can't help but feel for her, it's a really poor decision in her career to stay for another two years. She's 24. She has made 211 appearances for Juventus. That's the most in anyone at Juventus women. She was there from the start. She has amassed 50 goals for them. She is the highest scoring Serie A midfielder in the history of Serie A. Um, she is she's just quality and again she's 24 her potential is through the roof I can't help but think considering she's won everything that there is to win domestically in Italy for her to sign and stay for another two years when Juventus currently is a sinking ship with no identity to stay for another two years for me is a really strange move 
But it's like the Germans, right? Has, traditionally, the Germans don't move out of the German league. The Italians do not move. That's why we've only got two Italians in the WSL. They don't move about. It's why someone brought up Montemaro. He's already gone. They sacked him last, last month, Juventus. So they're now playing without a manager. They've got an interim who is pretty clueless, doesn't really know what he's doing. There's there's a lot of recruiting within in, in Italian football. I think the next manager that we see for Juventus is going to be a name that none of us know. It, it's just a really strange decision for me. I feel like she needs to try her luck elsewhere. Juventus did horrendously uh, in the Champions League this season. Hopefully they do better next season, but... Yeah, for her, for her and her development at 24 years old, I would have liked to see her try something new, but she's not. She's there for another two years unless someone buys her out. United, I'm talking to you. You could do with her. There's a little nudge for you. Um, Grosso. Grosso is a superb player. Again, United fans, you've been linked to, to Grosso. I did a TikTok about it, explaining it all. So if you want to go and watch that in better detail, go over to that and, and I talk about that in, in better detail. Um, brilliant goal scoring midfielder, but also defensively really sound. And I think that's something that potentially United have lacked this season is that stability in midfield. So, yeah, that's I think that, that would be a fantastic signing if that's the case. And I, I imagine she is probably on the move too. Um, Berenstein for United. I, I was speaking to Connor about that actually the other day, whether that was a move that they was interested in. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. She, she's on a run of really poor form at the minute, and I she does need a confidence boost. But knowing Mark Skinner, uh, she'll probably sit on the bench for a couple of months, so she won't get any confidence from from that side of things. Um, so yeah, it's just a little bit crazy in Italian football at the minute, and. There's a lot of big gaps. Teams do it's, it's there's a there's a famous saying that's like across the board in Italy, they're always ten years behind everything else. And this is no this is no sort of it's exactly the same for for football, women's football. We've seen in in England, Chelsea, Arsenal, City dominate the WSL for years and years and years, and this is what we're seeing right now. There's not a lot of money in there. In, in the league so once that once that popularity boom hits we're uh we're gonna start seeing a, a better quality of football uh and hopefully more players like Lena Magol taking the switch to over to to the Italian leagues so thanks for listening to can my I, can I just check how many appearances you said she's on who Caruso how many did you say 211 211 yeah at 24, does that That's not sound yeah. really high to anyone else? That's she joined Juventus at 17. She, yeah, she was at, at Juventus at 17, has been a starter since she was 17. She's she's that good. That's crazy. That's like over 30 a season, every season, pretty much, or around that. That's my, my quick mental maths on it. This is she, she, I've, I've just done the maths, and it's literally if you take a seven year span from 17 to 24, and it is. 30.1 a season, so literally 30 games oh. a season since she was 17. That's just mental. She's that reliable. Is... She, I'm going to touch wood as I say she doesn't get injured. She does not get injured. She's reliable. She'll score goals for you. She's just, if you want a midfielder, a perfect midfielder that, do, that does it all, it's Ariana Caruso. And the fact that, that she, if she plays in any other league, she's nominated for all sorts of awards. But have a look at her stuff, guys. It's honestly so worth it. I've just been having a look at the league. And it, oh, it, it hurts my eyes. But they, they do this thing they do in Scotland, don't they? Split. Split and half. Yeah. Um, the great thing is, is they're three games into it and you just look at the league, it's still in exactly the same order as it was before they did the split. Um, it feels like the most pointless thing that I've ever seen in my life, actually. But there we go. I'm not a huge fan of the, the league splitting and, and things like that, but but there we are. <laughs> so there we go. I'm sure we'll be talking more um, as the Italian leagues kind of 
come to the clone and a lot of players to keep an eye on, as you said, obviously grow. So it's definitely one over the summer to, to be keeping on. I think we're expecting her to be moving as well. If anyone was interested, Bayern women did win over the weekend as well. So they've kind of kept their gap to Wolfsburg in the front. Bundesliga, it's looking like they've had another step towards the title. I think they can win it in two games time, I think. So they're pretty much there um, from their point. I don't think they've actually got any ridiculously tough fixtures left either so it's looking very likely that they're going to get over the line in Germany um, speak, we're speaking about midfielders there so I'm going to come to you Laura for a player who has played probably every position bar midfield actually <laughs> in Rachel Daly um, so we have seen obviously in the last seven days since a retirement from international football um, I guess the question is were you surprised by that what's your thoughts around it obviously it's just international football so she's going to continue obviously with uh, with, with, with Aston Villa um, I, I, I'd not lie I can't remember that what she said in her in her post that she put out. So I'll have to go back and look at that while you're saying your piece on it. But you know, from an England point of view, do you think it's the right time you know, for her to be stepping away from it? Obviously the versatility is something, you know, some people have said that's probably let not let her down, but like hindered her a little bit in terms of she doesn't have a nailed position. So it's it's difficult for her to to be selected as such. But yeah, was it a surprise to you? What's your kind of thoughts around that retirement? I don't think I expected it. Like, I don't think it came at a conventional time. And sometimes you kind of get, like, talk of, oh, this will be X's last game or X is thinking of retiring. And I didn't feel like you got too much of that around Rachel Daly. So I think I wasn't, like, massively shocked because obviously she's one of the more senior players in the team and potentially heading that way anyway. But, yeah, like, I wasn't expecting it for sure. Um, I think it makes sense. I think it's almost like, I think you've got to look at it through the perspective of, okay, so she could have gone out on a relative high making the World Cup final. But at that point, there was still the potential of going out on an Olympics. So I think it's almost like didn't make the Olympics and then you don't want to retire on just not having made the Olympics. So you stick around for a bit longer, but actually the load is a lot, you're not really getting much game time, like when else are you going to retire, like you could wait to the summer, but kind of, I guess, what's the point, so yeah, I kind of understand the decision, and I think it makes sense, in terms of like an England perspective, um, I think it's interesting, because I think she has kind of been a little bit phased out, I think Neve Charles has slotted in nicely at left back, I don't think Rachel Daly was going to be a starter, um, it's nice to have that backup, but you'd hope that the depth that England has is not going to be like the end of the world. Um, and yeah, I think we can just kind of celebrate her career and how important she was to an England side that won the Euros without kind of, and that development, like she's been there throughout it. Obviously, I do think there is that factor, like she never really got to play in her favoured position for England. Um, but yeah, I think... She's probably not like a huge miss, but she has been a really important player. Um, and it's probably a pretty reasonable time to go out, even though it wasn't particularly expected. So say right after, not long after, obviously after the, the, the game against Ireland, was it? It was the day after. Obviously, this all uh, came out. Meg, was it a surprise for yourself? Obviously, you know, as Laura kind of touched on there and it's been mentioned in the chat, obviously it does leave a, a massive gap in the number nine. But obviously with Russo there, you know, there's question marks over where Russo's best position is. I mean, that's been going on for God knows how many years <laughs> with Russo trying to find where her best position is. Um, TJ's followed up, obviously, with potentially Beaver Jones being the, the future number nine. Um, from that point of view, obviously. So is, is that where it con maybe concerns you a little bit? Obviously, that the daily has gone from that position, obviously also from a left-back point of view, having that versatility there. So, yeah, what's your thoughts overall on on, on Daly's retirement from England? Yeah, it was interesting because I, I watched the video where she, you know, kind of talked about her reasons. And I think she said something like, oh, it's time for the next generation. And, you know, maybe it, it completely is. But when Serena hasn't been calling up those younger players in certain positions, like the number nine role, you don't really have anyone that's had the experience for the Lionesses. Yeah, the, you know, the, you know, like Aggie Beaver-Jones, she's played for the, you know, not the senior team, the under-23s and, you know, below and below. But apart from Russo and, you know, hence played in that number nine role as well and we all know that she plays really well in that number nine role. But there's not really anyone coming through in a sense yet for the Lionesses that, that, you know, I'd go, oh yeah, you know, apart from, you know, Russo, like, oh, I'll have her start as a striker. 
So it, it did come as a shock to me. I think the timing, you know, after a Euro qualifier was, it, you know, it feels like it's halfway through a season almost. Um, but she is, you know, 32. She, you know, if if she stayed till after the Euros next year, she'll be, she, I think she'll be nearly 35. No, nearly, no, nearly 34, sorry. Um, and so, you know, fair enough. And I think a lot, she spoke a lot about sp wanting to spend time with family more in her video. So obviously she spent so, so long in America that she obviously wouldn't come back very often and spend time with family. And she obviously felt like obviously playing in the WSL and then also playing for England, you know, took, took up a lot of her time, which obviously it does. But, um, I I was reading one of the BBC articles that they put out and Emma Sanders did a bit of analysis and basically said, like, you know, she's played for the Lionesses for eight years, I think it is, but she's never played a starring role. She, you know, she's never been that, oh, Rachel Daly. You know, she's played as a left-back for so long and only recently, you know, we've seen her in that strike position. You know, we in the Euros, she was, you know, starting left-back and then we did see her, I think she started every I don't know how many games she started in the World Cup but we saw her you know in most World Cup games and we saw the impact she had you know in front of goal but you know if she, if she played as a striker for more years would she have been a more played a more star role maybe um but I think she I believe she scored on her debut against Serbia so it's interesting that you know she scored on her debut but then you know she she was a left back for most of her you know Lioness's career so no it, you know it's I, I was really sad actually when it came out cuz I love Rachel Daly and you know you look at her and she won the golden boot last season you know she's clearly a good striker so yeah it'll, uh, it, it'll be interesting to see her you know focus more on club football which is obviously what she said she want, wants to do obviously with it being Aston Villa you know what does she want from Villa you know does she want to win trophies because you know you're not guaranteed to do that at Villa or you know will she make a late move somewhere who knows but no it was a shock but it also kind of makes sense at the same time. And Mia I'll throw it to yourself because obviously you were out there in uh... I was going to say Belfast. That is definitely not Belfast, Dublin. <laughs> got, got the wrong Ireland. <laughs> You're right in Dublin for the. Uh... <laughs> I'm so glad I stopped myself. <laughs> I've said it anyway, but even there. Anyway, you were out there, in Ireland, obviously, for that. <laughs> was there kind of a, a hint that that might be coming? Obviously, she'd come off the. <laughs> Can't bring him a composure for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, you know what the question is. Were you it's the same kind of thing? We obviously surprised. We, we kind of expected it, seeing it off, <laughs> laughing at the stadium and, and things like that. Um, no, no, we we had no idea. We had no idea at all. I actually filmed her coming onto the pitch, which I didn't realise I'd done until the morning after. Um. The thing with, with the thing with this for me is it's just I I do get it, but I also don't get the timing at all. I don't get it. the timing of it is weird for me. Because we're still in the midst of European qualifiers. And someone said in the comments, she's probably not gonna play. And that's true, she probably won't play in the Euro in the Euros. However, we still have like two more sets of games. That was three that I've mimicked there, but two. We've got some coming up in June. Maybe I'm lying. Anyway, point stands. I I don't know why she hasn't gone out and said, last game, we're probably going to have another, another Wembley game in this fires. This is going to be my last game. The crowd then, the England fans, get to then show their appreciation to her for her eight years of service. It's still, it's a sensitive subject, Jess, that I realised again yesterday is just a bit too sensitive. <laughs> um, I, as you know, as an England fan, I'd have loved for her to have had the send-off 
that she deserves in front of the England fans. To them to be in Dublin and for her just the next day to say, okay guys, I'm not coming back now. What? It just feels weird to me. Like it's not there wasn't it's not an end. There's not an end point in it. There's still two two more sets to play. So clearly something's in her brain has has clicked and something's changed maybe as a, a circumstance or you know that's that's not for us to to know but i did think how she, how she left was was weird but you know it 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 is sad and she you know she i will always picture her singing on the stage at trafalgar square and that's a core memory i'll have to the day i die so yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame. But um yeah, bring on the next generation, I guess. They they keep they keep retiring. They'll just keep retiring. It opens up the interesting conversation. I don't want to get into this. This is probably for another show, actually, uh, when we talk about you know international time. Because I think there's quite a few in that England squad you're looking at thinking they're they're not gonna be much longer. I think when you <clears throat> you know, there's a couple of like you know, Frank Kirby, I don't think will be a million. You know, kind of. I think Lucy Bronze is probably not a million miles away either. I think there's a few players you look at and think that they'll be in the next like year. I think personally, but I don't. Know. What do I know? Um, Barry, go on. Round us off on Rachel Daly. Uh, your kind of left back extraordinaire. <laughs> you were loved having the debates with on <laughs> last season. Oh, do you know what? It just takes me back to my frustration with international football. If I'm honest with you. Um, I, I, the highlights of our lives where we had these constant arguments about picking these top 11s and then everyone was just going, oh, we'll stick Rachel Daly and at left back because then we've got a really good striker as well. And, you know, I, I spent most of last season talking about how I felt it was quite disrespectful to Rachel Daly, actually, that she was performing as well as she was, scoring as many goals as she was. Um, and she was just being shunted back into left back. Um, because they felt that was a reasonable position for her. Um, you look at Leslie Russo, and I've maintained, like all throughout the last few years, that that she, for me, is a better striker than Beth England currently. And I see there's people suggesting that Beth England might be short term somebody they could turn to. And you know, whilst that might be true, again, you look at the statistics. The statistics don't don't bear that out. Um, she's not been scoring a lot of goals. You know, we're talking about having a pure number nine um, for Barcelona. Well, you know, we're, we're not going to have one for England either. Um, so whether we can go off and score seven or eight goals will be quite interesting. I sort of wonder if, if maybe you look at someone like Nikita Paris. She's scored a lot of goals for United this season and she's been entirely overlooked. Um, Lauren Hemp, as we've mentioned, is someone who can go in there, but she's not really a natural forward. Um, but another name that's not really been mentioned much is Lauren James. Um, is there the potential to get her into a sort of a false nine position so that we're not necessarily playing with that um, target person, so to speak, but rather they have the ability to change it about. So there's a lot that could happen internationally. It'll be quite interesting to see how that occurs. Um, but for me, I think that Rachel Daly is pretty much done the right thing. I don't think she was going to be chosen as a, a striker generally. To be fair, her season hasn't been anything like the season that she had last year with, with Aston Villa. And as a result, it was always going to be a bit tricky. I think we've got a lot of people coming through. Grace, Grace, Grace Clinton's another one that we've mentioned earlier on that could potentially be doing that job. And, and do we need to? You know, is, is this where football starts to evolve a bit more? Do we like I say, get rid of that nine position and, and have some more, you know, attacking midfielders working their way across and not just having a target. I don't know. Um, and like Sean says, these are very nice problems for England to have, and they are. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's lots you could probably talk about with regards to that. But I suppose for, for Rachel Daly, all I would, would add on that is that she's been an absolute workhorse internationally and domestically. Um and I think that the biggest bit of respect that I have for her is the fact that she has that little bit of every little boy and girl that's ever wanted to play for their country in so far as it doesn't really matter where you put me, 
I just want to turn out for my country and represent them. And for that, I, I think she deserves a standing ovation. And uh, what is it you kids say nowadays? We should give her her flowers. Is, is that what it is? <laughs> um, so, yeah, let's, let's go. I never thought I'd ever you say that. I've never used that phrase in my life. You've never used it? No. I've seen it somewhere on the uh, on the social media. <laughs> I've made myself sound so I've, def- I've definitely tweeted off the WFC account at least once. <laughs> there we go. I knew I'd seen it somewhere. I was just making this up. Mia's just lost the plot entirely over there. As if we don't give flowers to winners. There we go. Somebody's going to watch the Olympics. <laughs> Might be Great Britain that year, that's for sure. I'm sorry, Barry, what me? <laughs> but it's definitely there. I'm gonna find it. I'm gonna retweet it. I'm gonna put your name in it. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> there we are. Yeah, I've got nothing to add. That, that these guys have politely put and eloquently put on uh, Rachel Daly's international career. <laughs> yes, he does. He uses it all the time, actually. Um, so maybe that's oh. why you've seen it. So Ian what's Wright that? Ian Wright is <laughs> She's what? Sorry. Ian Wright is sixty. That's what all the kids say. But, Thank you, Ian Wright. Well, all right, <laughs> maybe the kids 50 years ago. I don't know. I wasn't alive 50 years ago, Mia. Who was I? No, yeah. it wasn't. Fact. There we go. There we go. Thank you, I thought it was an old saying as well. It's a bit like flares and quips. They've just come back round again. <sighs> <laughs> I was literally just googling to see like where it came from, like whether it's just a. I know, I've, I'm not diving into. It the, feels the, like the plague. <laughs> it feels like the plague era. If you're giving someone flowers, that's what it feels like. So I'm going to call it an old, an old saying. Yeah, that's fine, Barry. We can bring it back. We can bring it back. Make it a new saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> I wish I was as good at football as Ian Wright was. But uh, the only thing Ian Wright and I have got in common is our lack of follicular growth. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Right, well, <laughs> moving on to the last part. Also, also that is worth mentioning because as we get towards the end of the seasons, you always get the highs of promotions and the title winners, and the lows, obviously, of relegations and those kind of things. And we've got a couple to to quickly run through. That have been confirmed. Um, obviously, what if people don't know Watford have been relegated from the championship, so they'll go into the southern tier of tier three. Uh, and we've got our two tier three winners already uh, in Portsmouth and Newcastle. Now, Newcastle obviously has been well documented um, with the the money that they have obviously put into Newcastle, and it would have been you know, if they didn't win their league. They're in obviously a league that me and Meg know very well. If they didn't win that this season, that would have been very poor on their part because they are the only. They won't be anymore, but they were the the first and only full time team in tier three. So they they should have gone up, and they have done so. Fair play to them; they deserve it. Um, so Laura, I'll start with yourself. Um, obviously Watford going down. Obviously sad for them. It's always sad to see any team uh, go down. It, obviously worth noting from a Newcastle point of view, they won ten nil, which won them the league, which equally then relegated Huddersfield at the same time. The team that they then beat ten nil. So it's like a double blow for, <laughs> for Huddersfield on that day, um, on that one. Um, but yeah, have you got any thoughts on that one? I guess the question around Newcastle in terms of you know does this I guess show you know what can be achieved with with big investment? You know, a couple of seasons ago they were further down the leagues and you know put a bit of money behind them, go full time, and they've absolutely smashed the leagues that you know they're in this season um, and going up into the championship. Yeah, I mean it's great that we're seeing a club kind of I guess benefit from having funding put into them because it shows if you put faith in your women's team and put the backing behind them it pays off so hopefully it can encourage more teams um and they've i think as well like through cup competitions their fan base has consistently shown that this they they're they're up for it i think growing a women's club shouldn't just be about like tier and position and players it's like about growing the club as well and i think the fact that they have done that in terms of growing a fan base is brilliant to see as well um so yeah, fully deserving, I guess. I It's not, yeah, I think it's kind of mentioned in the comments, but I think the only sour thing is the way the money's come about for Newcastle and you'd hope it came about a bit more organically in, like, I guess a team just wanting to support their women's team rather than a little bit of sports washing. Um, but, you know, if we're seeing teams 
other teams follow their suit, then it can't be um, a completely bad thing. I still feel gutted for Nottingham Forest, who obviously I think they're in third at the moment, but with a game in hand, so could finish second. But won that league last year, have similarly competed pretty well this season, um, but obviously lost in the playoff, which isn't happening this year, which is pretty gutting, really. Um, but that's last season's and I have to put that behind me now. Um, but yeah, I think it'll be really interesting to see how they do next year, whether as long as that funding continues, I guess. It's just getting, I think money can only take you so far if you don't have the right structures in place. So just making sure they've got those right structures and it's sustainable, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah, it should be, I think, I think it's super exciting to see a team that are going to absolutely want to compete come up in the championship because I don't think they're going to be happy with just, okay, consolidation. I think it's going to be another push on, which I think is super exciting. And I think I'm also really excited that if Sunderland don't get promoted, that that's pretty, pretty cool to have that rivalry in the women's championship next year. So say Sean's just referenced that there are potential Newcastle, Sunderland and Southampton, Portsmouth next season in the championship. That's too huge. Right, Newcastle, Sunderland, they put that on at St. James's Park or at um, the Stadium of Lights. The way that those fans are with the men's and women's team, you know, they'll pack those places out and we'll start seeing some record attendances for sure. <laughs> Thinking the in the championship on that one. Um, yeah, John's in the chat of President Sunderland representative. Um, yeah. They, they, they may get there. They're two points behind Palace. I, I don't think they will now, but, you know, there's, there's potential. Um, Trevor, you're talking about hashtag. Yep, they're on the rise as well. Another team, obviously, it's been well documented. And, and have they, Barry, you'll probably know this. Have they gone up yet? Or are they still in the hunt for promotion? Hashtag in tier four. I don't believe it has happened yet, but they are not a million miles away from it, is my understanding. But I shall check that and get back to you, sir. That's so why they're doing that. I'll throw it over to Meg. They're obviously talking about. You know, there was a, another point made about is it uh, is it normal to the championship to have yo-yo clubs? Like Watford obviously keep going kind of up and down. The kind of Watford have been a weird side. Obviously, used to, when it was WSL one and two that you know they were pushing in the WSL one as it was back then. Um, now, obviously, kind of went that's two three back up to championship and I go down again. It's like kind of a bit weird for them. Um, but it, as you know, Newcastle and Portsmouth going to the championship, can you see them, I guess, kicking on next season, I guess, solidifying um, themselves in in tier three? But I also want to throw a secondary question just to you. Um, I guess from, from a Wolves point of view, a team that you know well, you know, would they feel a little bit, not that they could, I guess, done too much against Newcastle this season, but a little bit disappointed. They're always there or thereabouts, you know, in the fight for the promotion. The format, I guess, changed to, to, to an automatic promotion. And then Newcastle come in with all the money, make it full time. And obviously, yeah, I don't know where Wolves will end up finishing this season, but yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? That I was literally, that's literally what I was going to say. So the past, well, the two seasons that I worked with Wolves women, it was them, Nottingham Forest and Burnley that were kind of the top three, if you want to call it that. And so whenever Wolves faced Burnley or Forest, it, you know, they were the exciting games that you know we didn't know if we we were going to win or lose and that was the exciting part and obviously Wolves only lost the league last season on goal difference um and then I actually went to the playoff game between Forest and Watford um but it, it it's heartbreaking purely for the fact that you know I, I'm not heartbroken for Forest and Burnley necessarily but because they've been up there with Wolves for the past few seasons as well and then all of a sudden when the playoff gets scrapped, which obviously I don't believe it should have been there anyway. It's just that, you know, ironic that the season it gets scrapped is the season that Newcastle come and absolutely storm the league. I mean, at the beginning of the season, I kind of, I, I just thought, yeah, Newcastle are going to win it. I didn't expect anything less, really. Um, so in terms of that I mean, obviously, obviously, I, I follow a lot of Wolves women or Wool, you know, Wolves fans on Twitter, and they're really like, they were like, "Where's our investment?" You know, we need investment, sort of thing, because you know these teams are. I mean, Wolves, you know, they were in the they uh, they were in the playoff final the first season that I worked there, um, and you know they'll start not necessarily dropping down, but what do they need to do to try and, you know, be the Newcastle and try and get into the championship? Because that's what they ultimately want. And that's what ultimately, you know, Nottingham Forest and your Burnleys want because they're always in and around there. 
but now Newcastle it's like obviously Newcastle have been amazing all season and you know yes they've had the funding but it is the players on the pitch at the end of the day that have to put in the performances and they've done that and you know they've scored the goals that they need to um so yeah it's interesting and obviously Watford won the Southern Division and obviously went up through the playoffs, but they're going to come down again. Will they become a yo-yo side? Who knows? As when we talk about yo-yo sides, I automatically think of Norwich men in the uh, in the men's game because they used to be a really yo-yo side going up to the Premier League, coming back down to the Championship. But so, sometimes it's quite exciting, not exciting, but to have a yo-yo team that, you know, come back up, go down, I mean, I wouldn't like to be part of a team that's a yo-yo team because, you know, you're elated one season and then completely not not happy the next season. But, no, it's interesting. And as uh, the comments said about the uh, the derbies that, you know, could be taking place in the championship next season, that'll be, that'll be really exciting to look out for. I realised as well while you were talking there, and, and I think, Barry, obviously, because you're the only one that calls me that, <laughs> put it in the chat about being nine points behind Portsmouth. I completely discredited hashtag because I genuinely thought they were in tier four, not tier three already. That's why they're nine points behind Portsmouth. So I've done them a disservice there and put them a division down. <laughs> that they were actually yeah, they in. Right, last season, they did incredibly well, hashtag, and uh, just beat Billy Ricky to it. See, and it's going to be interesting to do this really off on a very, very minor tangent, but what happens with promotion relegation in in tier three because of the way the leagues then split into regions into tier four and so on you've then got to work out like it depends on who goes down it's not an automatic drop into another league it like then depends on oh well if they go down then they can go into that league and like there's a lot of moving about that's going to happen because obviously Huddersfield and Fylde have gone down from the northern division but it's going to depend on who comes up and then Stourbridge could get moved from that from the northern one into the southern, if too many northern teams are in that division as well, so it really depends on who comes up and down in terms of what happens in those leagues. It's why I'm not a fan of regional leagues. I get why it's it needs though, to be isn't it? But, and I'll tell you what, yeah. you might not be a fan of the regional league, but I'll tell you something: when you're not getting paid wages to travel or get well, that's what I was going to say. I can yeah. I can understand why it's needed further down the pyramid, but it's, it's I, I don't want to be that guy who's uh, sorting all that out. That's for sure. Um, Thomas obviously making the point about Watford. Yeah, they did have quite a few Arsenal uh, academy players there. Didn't they let? Didn't Arsenal let Watford play them as well? Like against them in the cup. Um, I think I can't remember which cup it was. It might be the FA um, on that one. And they were, from what I saw, relatively good in that one as well. Uh, I'm not all clued up on Arsenal academy players, so I, I can't. I couldn't name you the players off the top of my head. I can't lie. I, I believe that, um, the Katie Reed, the 17 year old that made her debut for us uh, last night, I believe she was on a dual contract as well at Watford. And we recalled her at some point in the season. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's right. Yeah. And uh, Michelle Adjuman scored in that game as well against Arsenal, even though she's an Arsenal player, like dual registration as well. Can you imagine if that knocked Arsenal out of the cup at that time? That would have been quite something. <laughs> if, 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 we lost, that, if we had lost to Watford, I would, yeah, I would have been. <laughs> oh, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been quite something. Um, Mia, throw it over to you then. Um, I said Newcastle coming up. Obviously, there were a lot of money um, being banded about. I said in tier three, fully professional. And like I said, fair play to them because, and it's not just you know, in the way they're doing it. Obviously, you know, there's question marks as always, obviously, around where that money's coming from. But the fan base that they've obviously got there as well. I'm really excited for one to see them in the championship because we saw Southampton go up last year or the year before. And then I, I can't remember, it must have been the year before because their first season in the championship, they almost went straight up and in, in straight up into the WSL. Um, so, yeah, just your thoughts on that. And also, like I said, talking a little bit about Watford, obviously becoming a little bit of a, a yo-yo side now, kind of going, you know, up and down, up and down. And, uh, yeah, it's not necessarily great to see. Yeah, so, I mean, Newcastle, uh, I'm really on the fence about Newcastle. I know there's a lot of love for Newcastle and how that their story is pretty incredible, but when you put money behind it and you get good facilities and good coaches and you can pay your players well, anything less than promotion is a failure. So them winning the league is great for them, but you, I can't help but feel for the rest of the clubs who are battling it out on a really level playing field and they're playing through the talent that they have. They're not relying on any money that they've got behind them. Uh, so in that regard, I, I feel for the 
that the leagues that they've trumped the last two seasons uh because it's again it's that they've been absolutely battering teams all season and again that's great for them but uh not too great for the league so i do believe next season they're going to be in the league that suits them the best um yeah and watford it's it's a tough one i i've seen watford at, at their lowest a couple i think it was 20 2017 and they had these aspirations one of their biggest biggest aspirations was to to be a wsl club that was their long term goal and they just uh, they just can't quite do it but someone said in the comments the men's the same i don't think it's a team specific thing i think it's a club thing that they just maybe aren't very well managed internally uh and there's probably a lot their visions are a lot bigger and higher than what's actually practical um so yeah you know they've they've borrowed a lot of players this season and that's great for one season but then if you get relegated you need to you need to figure a team out for yourself you need to to get in some good players and recruit well in the academy and, and all of that stuff and again it all boils down to money and we're at this point in women's football where there is a distinct difference in who's getting a lot of money and who isn't getting a lot of money. And it's really obvious, which is uh, a shame, but it's it's just how it is at the minute. Um, I don't see, I don't see Watford coming back up next season because I do believe that there's some great talent in the, the, the tiers below. And it's the same as Reading. Reading could have been in that situation. We could have seen Reading got get relegated from the WSL down to the Championship. They've not had the best of seasons this season. So, yeah, yo-yo team, yo-yo teams are weird, and they're not great for fans. And they, I would actually, I think someone said that they like them in in the comments. So I completely disagree. I think it's it gets boring and predictable if you know the same teams are getting up and then coming down, then getting up and coming down. Um, I like a bit of variation. So. It's the same with with Bristol City. They're they're obviously going to be relegated this season, and I don't see them coming back up with the quality that's in the Championship currently. Which is what a league the Championship has been this season, by the way. Yeah, I just don't see I, I don't see them coming back up. It's not it's not as easy as that. Um, but yeah, hope that's answered your question. No, I'm glad you brought up Bristol City. Sean's obviously mentioned them in the chat as well, and, and Reading's another. Um, can Reading still go down? From the championship, I'm pretty sure they can. They're still from the last time I checked. They're, they're teetering on the bottom. Um, Three points ahead of Lewis with uh, two games to go. That's what I mean. They're, they're, they're running a bit fine, um, and, and that's sad to see as well. But Barry, I'll throw the same question to you, but also I guess throwing in Bristol City because when we're talking about yo-yo teams, obviously they came up to WSL and now go straight back down, um, and we'll probably go. This that, this sounds really harsh, but probably will go down as one of the the worst WSL sides, and I think in terms of points. I think that statistically they are. But I think that's a bit harsh, and I will caveat by, by saying they've actually been good in a lot of games this season, and it's been very narrow scores that have, that have let them down, barring a few you know, heavy defeats. But, yeah, I mean, they... Go on. No, I thought you'd finish. No, no. Um, <laughs> they were a, a tricky side this season, and I think that they... They were unlucky because we're, we're in a state now where I, I mentioned this before and I mentioned it last week when we were on the show. The game is growing, but the game is going to grow at a certain pace. And the problem is, is that the game is growing at a pace that is not at a pace that everybody wants and expects. We are in the, the age of instantaneous gratification. So... It used to be if you wanted to go and do something, um, you'd have to go and find, like think about university, you'd have to go and find something in a book and now you can just get it on an internet like that. You know, we're sitting there going, oh, I wonder what the score is hit. Boom, it's there. It takes you seconds. Our biggest inconvenience at this point in our lives is if the Wi-Fi goes down and we can't get it immediately from the internet. That's how bad our lives Oh my God, I've got to look at a book. How the hell am I going to find this information? Um, God forbid I might have to talk to another human being, um, all of these things. And that's where we are. We just want these things to happen now. And that's the, the situation we're in. But it is going to 
um, explode and to grow. And, you know, people talk about yo-yo clubs being a bad thing. I just think that all a yo-yo club is, is an indication of the strength of the league above and the weakness of the leagues below. Um, we speak a lot and have spoken a lot when we were talking about the United um, Academy players and how they there's so much expectation that you could just play one of those players. So if you're having a defensive crisis, just stick one of your Academy players in um, and, and they'll be fine whilst ignoring the, the massive gap of quality that there is between academy football in the women's game and WSL at the top level. So it's the same thing with the championship at WSL. There's been a bit of a gap, but that gap is closing and, and that is becoming increasingly obvious. Um, and it's closing more so within the championship. That's why it's been so exciting. So... Yes, a yo-yo club can be quite boring for people going, oh, they're back again, oh, they've gone again, oh, they're back again, oh, they've gone again, oh, they're back again, oh, they've gone again. Yes, that does get quite annoying, but it just goes to show they're just too good for the, the league below. They're just not so great at the league above. And that's, again, a, a boardroom issue. Do you put the investment in? Do you do something about it? Do you actually back your side and try and give them the opportunity to stay up when they get up? Or are you just assuming that they're going to, you know, pull off some sort of miraculous great escape and, and somehow stay up. Reading are the exact embodiment of that when you consider it because they've been relegated. They've had the opportunity to be that yo-yo club and come back. And clearly it just looks like all funding seems to have just been pulled and that there doesn't seem to be um, any sort of impetus from them as a club to want to do any better because they have dropped massively and and could now be dropping into the WNL, which would have been unthinkable those years ago when you were walking up those steps and being told to walk up even further because you can't possibly stand in that position there. So, yeah, Reading's an interesting one. Uh, I see John saying he thinks the gap between the WSL and the, the championships getting bigger every year. Like in the height at the top, maybe so. But I, I think there will be um, – it, it will it – will, decrease it genuinely will because there will be more people like you look at newcastle if newcastle win the championship next year they'll be given enough money to come in and be competitive so as as a result but again it's going to be over time um the money thing is an, a really interesting part of this as well people talking about the newcastle situation um this is happening across the board now so i was gobsmacked so you're talking about tier three and tier four um, as you well know, my my teams are in tier five at the minute. And um, the team that is at the top of our league, Real Bedford, they have been flying. Like they, they've not lost a league game all season. <laughs> and uh, just out of nowhere, um, their non-league men's team as well are getting a £3.6 million cash investment from... Uh, across the pond in America, thanks to some Bitcoin people. Now, it's, it's amazing. Um, that's going to go towards ground improvements, all of these sorts of things. But it's this whole point of when you start to invest in your team and when you start to invest in um, the, the women's game and, and everything that that uh, in, entails, you are going to find that these gaps become less and less and less. Um, you know, clearly they're looking to to push their team up quicker. And I, I've said this since I came onto these channels. If you just give a women's team £5 million, it would absolutely blow most clubs out of the water that season. £5 million. You know, that's not even like Ronaldo's shoelace. It's crazy that the amount of money we're talking about. And when you consider that, it's only going to take people... Um, Somebody put in the comments earlier on, this is what happens when, um, you know, clubs start to take their women's team seriously. I think if they do that, then we are 100% going to be in a situation where the game will just absolutely explode, full of people, again, trying to close the gap and, and giving more options across the league. So, yeah, I think we are going to be in something really exciting. The WSL this season has been much closer, much better. The fact we've got two new teams going into the, the FA Cup final, 
um, and what you've just spoken about in the championship just goes to show that the women's game, especially here in, in the UK, is growing, it's thriving, uh, and it's just going to carry on doing that. And I think that everything we're talking about there within the championship and all of these things just goes to show that we are in for a hell of a decade, to be honest with you. I, I think the next 10 years of women's football is just going to be so exciting. To, to the point of even like commentary and punditry and all of the things that you're seeing, the offering that we're getting, like what I've been watching at the weekend, was so much better. Um, we had Izzy Christensen on the um, on the men's football as well. And to me, she was the only one talking sense. Like genuinely, we are seeing an absolute just explosion of decent product featuring women. And I say that through, like I say, the commentary, the punditry, uh, the journalistic side, and of course the football um, and I just, honestly, it's going to be so brilliant. Like in 10 years time, we're going to be sat around in this conversation and like the WSL is going to have a hundred teams in it. And it's on it as well, maybe not a hundred, but you get my gist. It's going to be absolutely bloody brilliant. And that's why you should stay with us. This sounds really cringy. You know, I'm going to go with it because I'm going to follow off what you said. Just stick with us on Awful Women's Football because we'll be covering it over the next that sounds really weird saying over the next decade, doesn't it? Because I'll be in my 30s Absolutely. by the time that happens. Oh, my God. I, I was old before. <laughs> Shane, if you want to hit the BBC up, us five will do it. Plus Jess, she's not on tonight, but there'll be six of us. We can do it. Just hit up the BBC. If they want to give us a gig, we'll, we'll happily do that. Um and take that over but there we are right we've been going for an hour and 30 so uh, we'll look to wrap it up there because me and Barry have now done nearly well three hours worth of shows <laughs> since seven o'clock and I am absolutely shattered now it's been a long weekend and I had next to no sleep last night so I'll wrap it up there um one thing I just wanted to end on oh god what's he bringing up now oh for god's sake is that cool enough my auntie knitted it, and I've never worn it. Is that a cool enough Ian right hat, Sean? I'm that desperate is, to... That is Where's Wally. Here he hello. is. I was going to say hello, Where's Wally. <laughs> you found him. Oh, my goodness. That's lovely. I'll tell you what, it's warm. You've got to a bubble on the top. Where's the bubble? Oh, because then it would be Where's Wally. <laughs> it's you not, know, to be fair. <laughs> I'm trying to think whether it's actual hats, red and white. But... And the glasses. You actually are. Where's Wally with them glasses too? Oh. I mean, with that, I think I'd need your glasses to be officially Where's Wally because it is rounder. We can um, get that. We can sort that out. We can, yeah. yeah we'll it. It <laughs> there we go. Next show, we'll get that sorted for you. Um, yeah, NC, I'm not retiring. Get a bobble on there and then you really will. I I'm not retiring in my 30s. <laughs> well, I'd love to, but I highly doubt it. <clears throat> Uh, no, one thing I wanted to say um, uh, before we wrap this one up, if there's any shows you guys want to see or anything like that, put it in the comments of this, just reply to this video and things like that. So if there's any particular shows, because I've had a couple of messages in the last, like, literally last day <laughs> saying about, oh, you should do this show, this show, this show. If you can drop it in the comments of this video um, so we can see it and, and, and everything else, we'll try and get some of those shows kind of planned in throughout the week. So at the moment, obviously, we're just doing the Monday ones and things like that. You guys are the viewers. You tell us what you want to see uh, and, and things like that. Let us know in the comments. We'll try and get those shows booked in and those kind of things. Make sure you're liking the video, subscribe, and follow all of the socials and things like that. It's all in the description. Following these lovely people on Twitter, all of their handles are on screen and things like that. If we don't have a show later on this week, we'll be back same time, Monday, 8.30 next week. So have a good week all, and we'll see you guys in the next one.